Hello, good evening. My name is Philip Preston and I would like to welcome you to our second online marketing club event, Every Brand Needs a Point. The Marketing Club was created primarily to help students get the most from their Graduate Gateway accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. This club event is one of four online events we will run this academic year. Future dates are the 18th of March and the 21st of April. Of course, CIM members and other marketing practitioners are welcome to attend, as well as students. As you can appreciate right now, the club exists online only, but when things return to normal, we hope to provide networking opportunities for students and marketing practitioners. The CIM Graduate Gateway program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions Graduate Gateway provides. If you are a student, you can sign up now to receive the Graduate Gateway newsletter. Simply use the QR code you can see on this slide. Each edition will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. The presentation will last for approximately 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the questions box in your control panel, which you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen if watching on a laptop, or along the bottom if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we are using the hashtag CIM events. You'll find in your control panel, there's a drop-down menu which, um, where you'll find two handouts. One is a PDF of today's presentation, and the other is a list of further reading which you might find useful. The webinar has been recorded and it will be available to view on the CIM YouTube channel within three to four working days. Okay, I'd now like to hand over to Bruce M. McKinnon, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you very much, Phil, and uh, thank you also for inviting me back to speak um, at the Chartered Institute of Marketing Marketing Club. I'm going to uh, spend 35, 40 minutes or so talking about brand strategy. Um, but before I do, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, and it's a story that um, kind of just illustrates, from my point of view, you know, the power and potency that brand strategy can deliver an organization. So I was um, in Nova Scotia talking to uh, Jeff Moore. Fittingly, we were in uh, one of his company's cafes. And he was sitting across the table from me. And he was the founder, co-founder and president of a coffee company called Just Us. And uh, they had a thriving range of cafes around the country. Their products were available pretty much in all, all the supermarkets. And um, I asked him what I thought was a relatively straightforward question, which was the name Just Us, Jeff. It's, What's, what's, what's the story behind it? But it seemed as though I'd actually asked him quite a difficult, difficult question because he didn't immediately answer me. He sort of thought about it for a while and looked at his coffee and, uh, and he said, yes, um, it's called Just Us because it sounds a little bit like Justice. And uh, we're a fair trade coffee company. We work uh, with the producers um, and we pay them a fair price. And so yes, that's that's just us. Sounds a little bit like justice, and, and and that's that's the reason. I said I don't think it is, Jeff. I think there must be a better reason for you to call yourself this kind of unusual name, just us. And by the way, I know you can't see this, but it also has an exclamation mark after the word us. So he went back to his coffee, went back to ruminating on this question. And whilst he's doing that, I can give you the backstory. Jeff uh, and Deb uh, were a married couple, and about 25, 30 years ago, they decided they wanted to start a fair trade coffee company. And so Jeff flew down to Chiapas in Mexico and spent some time with a, um, a co op, coffee co op called uh, Usiri. And after a few days, he phoned Deb and uh, they discussed the idea and decided yes, they were going to start a coffee company. Deb got on the phone to the bank, uh, organized a, a remortgage of their house. And a few weeks later, a huge container of coffee arrived on their front lawn. And um, much like uh, a, a typical entrepreneur, they looked at each other and said, well, oh, what do we do next? 
anyway, what they did next was great. And as I say, they were now um, running a very successful business. And um, so getting back to, to, to this question I'd asked, asked him, he said, yes, it's just, it's, it's just us. We're a small company. We're up against the big corporates. We're up against the kind of consumer indifference to the plight of coffee growers. That's it. It's, it's, there's, we're just a small company up against the big guys. No, 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 no. I said again, I really think there's a more compelling reason, Jeff, for this name. And look, to be to be completely honest with you, this is not something that happens infrequently because as brands and businesses grow, um, you know, they morph, they change. What seemed like a good idea sort of 25, 30 years ago maybe isn't such a good a good idea now. Or, you know, the reason for something being named something has been lost in the mists of time. It's very, very normal. It's a very common thing I found. And, and it's so it's a really good idea to sort of question things like your name or, or your collateral because you're kind of carrying them along with you. With you. And, and, um, and my final, you know, be, I had an English accent and it always helps in North America. So I, I get, get away with being a little bit rude. But Jeff, what he came back with was so good that I wrote it down and I'm going to read you what he said now, word for word. He said, you know, Bruce, we are all on this journey of life together and we are all part of the same human family. And as we visit our partners throughout the world and share their struggles, successes and dreams, this connection has continued to drive us. So the most powerful of all reasons for the name and the most concrete is the idea that there is no them and us, just us. That there is no them and us, just us. And it was a fabulous moment because it was a window into almost the soul of that company. You know, it, he, he did captured what's at the heart of, of their brand. And it kind of released a direction for us to start to move towards. It was the beginning of, of their story. And, uh, and what he'd pretty much done is to define the point of their brand. And, you know, I like points. Um, and I like points because they stick into things. And, and every organization needs a point, a sharp definition of its focus that's going to stick in people's minds. And that means making a choice, of course, about what that one point is. And that could be fiendishly hard. You know, when I ask clients to define what they do in a single sentence, every client usually responds in the same way, which is, it's just not possible, Bruce. It depends on, on our products we're focusing on. It depends on the audience that we're, we're, we're addressing. It depends on the campaign we're running. It depends on the territories that we're in. And all those responses are valid and have their place. But the role of a brand strategy is to sit above the minutiae and to be relevant to every part of the organization. And so to meet this need, to, to, to help solve this problem, I founded my practice back in 2009 and developed a framework called the Brand Arrow that would help clients to be able to discover and then define their point. And in our session today, we're going to cover the six big benefits of a brand strategy. We're then going to define what a brand strategy is, the elements that go into a brand strategy. And then we're going to touch on what you can do with a brand strategy, uh, what, what, what a brand strategy does. And then we're going to hand back to Phil, who's going to manage some, some Q&A. But before I dive in, um, I think it's very important that we actually define what we mean by the term brand and uh, the term brand strategy. So brand, you know, the reason why I think it's important to define the, uh, a brand is there's all kinds of ways of describing it. Um, and, um, and so uh, if we're going to have a useful conversation, then we need to establish some frames of reference. So a brand is a product or a service that delivers a consistent and distinctive benefit to a customer. A brand is a product or service that delivers a consistent and distinctive benefit to a customer. And it's going to contain within it a set of characteristics that it's going to use to differentiate itself uh, from competitors and remain familiar to its customers. And a brand, therefore, can be a product 
that you find on the shelf in a supermarket. It can be a professional service, a B2B brand, a B2C brand. It can be a, a charity, a fashion label. For any organization that has a point or a point of view that it wants to communicate is a brand. And a brand is created by or driven by a brand strategy. And I like to think of a brand strategy as simply a framework for you to make good choices about your brand. What a brand strategy is going to do is going to help you prioritize the purpose and character of all the different facets of your organization. So your services, your products, your messaging, your values, your culture, your sales, your marketing, how you treat your customers, your ambitions, all those things, all those facets, a brand strategy will be able to represent in a way that's relevant for, for every, every element and true for every element. So its role is to kind of discover, define and order the key elements of your brand story. So let's have a look at um, what these six big benefits are that I mentioned that we need to look at uh, as, as the first part of this presentation. OK, well, the first is that um, it is for everybody. It's for the whole organization, just as I've just alluded to in terms of you know, what a brand strategy is. Yes, uh, a CMO or a marketing director or, or, or somebody, um, I often actually work with CEOs, but, but it, it can often be brought in by the marketing team. But really, you know, the job of a brand strategy is not to represent marketing. It's to represent the entire organization because that's the job of a brand, isn't it? The job of a brand is to be, to represent all of the organization because all of the organization is, is, is job is, is to create and deliver that brand to its customers. You know, it stands to reason, doesn't it? That if everybody in the organization is aligned, if everybody, um, you know, is on the same page, um, you know, is headed in the same direction, you're gonna stand a much better chance of success than an organization that doesn't have that alignment, you know? And I actually think this alignment uh, it helps you to be much more efficient in how you use your resources because you're going to uh, have a business, have a brand that has consistency in how it communicates its, itself across its channels. There's going to be cohesion within the organization. Yeah, there's going to be a real sense that, you know, we know what our brand stands for. We know where we're headed. And that's also going to deliver an accountability, yeah? whether it's our, should this new product should we launch this new product? Is it in line with our brand? Should we engage this uh, sector, section of our audience? Should we you know, uh, bring along a, you know, a new strategy? Everyone is going to have the ability to be able to see, okay, this is what the brand means. This is what it represents. And um, going in the same direction means defining a vision, you know, um, a vision actually that you can all understand. And when I talk about visions, and we're going to come and look at it in a little bit more detail in a second, I'm not talking about a mission. I'm not talking about a mission or, or the dreaded statement. I'm, I'm talking about being able to define somewhere that you can all understand and somewhere you, for you to head to. And we'll come on to, to look at that uh, very shortly. Brand strategy is gonna distill your true value. You know, um, that conversation with Jeff Moore at, um, at Just Us, you know, was the beginning of a process where we were just kind of unearthing truths about the organization. We would kind of sometimes call it, you know, digging for hidden treasure, stuff that you've forgotten about. So that's a distilling your true value. And the process will also allow you to be able to really define in a crisp way, actually, you know, what are our, our key messages? Um, and, um, you know, I don't look for long lists when I'm developing key messages. You know, I look for uh, a list i.e. what's the first thing, what's the second thing, what's the third thing. And we'll come on to look at key messaging um, in the second part of this presentation. And finally, I think the job of a brand strategy that helps the entire company is to make you relevant to your customers and different from your competition. And that alludes back to the job of a, of a brand. So, so some very significant uh, benefits uh, a brand strategy will deliver to the entire company. So. Let's go on to look at the elements that make up um, a brand strategy. And, um, and I'm going to look at four. Uh, the vision, um, where I've just very briefly talked about the vision. Your positioning, which is kind of capturing the essence of your brand. 
your proposition, how, your proposition, how you express that essence, and then your brand values, the character of your brand. Knowing where you're going means when you arrive, you'll know you're there. <laughs> if you don't define where you're going, well, how do you know when you've got there? Um, and I'm being playful here, but but it's so important that an organization defines in a clear way where it is headed. I think of it as a destination. Uh, that for me is the most helpful way, you know, of thinking about where is it that we are going? Yeah, because we all need to get to that place. Yeah. How do you do that? What, what makes up a, a, a brand vision and why is it kind of different from, say, for a mission? Or, Well, I think there are three key attributes to a brand vision. A brand vision needs to be big, broad and long. It needs to be big because you kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're defining an ambition for your business. So you kind of want it to be big. You want it to be a, 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 you know, a stretch and um and it needs to be broad insofar as it needs to be relevant to the entire organization it's not a marketing or a product uh, ambition it's for the whole company so it needs to be broad and it needs to be long or rather long term and that de <laughs> depending on the, the the sector you're in that can mean anything from I don't know, 18 months for a startup or a scale up that I, uh, clients I work with right the way through to five to seven years down the line. And what we're trying to do is to is to kind of move beyond the transaction, yeah? to look at something in the kind of middle distance. And what's super helpful about, about being able to define a vision beyond knowing where you're headed, yeah, beyond all of you going in the same direction, is the fact that it can allow you to discover your barriers and your drivers, what I call your barriers and your drivers. So let's start with your drivers. What assets do we have as a business that is gonna help us move towards our vision? Because I think that's the job of a brand strategy. The job of a brand strategy is to equip you to move towards your destination. So we need to know what that is. The brand strategy needs to be able to define that vision. And your drivers, are, what have we got without changing them? that are going to help us move towards that vision yeah what can we build on so we may well have you know a, a fresh round of funding you know a fantastic leadership team um, an award-winning product um, a, 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 a insatiable demand for our product we might have an innovation that is unique in the market yeah so what have we got that's going to help us move towards um our, our vision and these drivers are very good at helping us to shape how we create our messaging. But frankly, I think even more importantly is to be able to define, well, what are our barriers? What are the things that are gonna slow us down or even stop us from, from moving towards uh, you know, our, our vision? What do we have to build up? Um, and, and these are kind of, the, what are the problems that we've got that we have to solve? Maybe we've got a team that works in silos. You know, they don't talk to each other. You know, maybe we've lost our, edge we've lost our appetite for innovation and a new a new brands come along that's kind of you know it, uh, is taking our market share perhaps consumer habits are changing perhaps we didn't move fast enough with the times and our barriers are brilliant because what our barriers can help us deliver uh, create our, our marketing objectives how do we deal with these these barriers because if we don't deal with these barriers if we don't remove these barriers then we're not going to be able to head successfully towards our vision so you can see uh, brand vision um, has a, a really very important part to play for the whole company, not just the marketing team. So, so that's uh, the brand vision. Um, so let's move on to what is uh, the, probably the most technical term that I use, um, uh, is it, which is brand positioning. Uh, and, um, and so what do I mean by brand positioning? It's how the brand is positioned in the minds of your team. How the brand is positioned in the minds of your team. Why is this important? Well, what makes a brand strategy, I think, distinct from something like a marketing strategy or an ad strategy um, is that the number one audience for your brand is you. It's your team. Because if your team don't get your brand, if your team don't understand your brand, then what hope do your customers have? because it's your team's job 
to communicate and grow your brand, communicate your brand to your customers and grow your brand and head towards that, help you to head towards that vision. So your brand positioning is how you position the brand in the minds of your team. What's the thread that runs through everything? Think of it, you could think of it as the DNA of your business. Now, every part of our business, if we sort of sliced it open, whatever, we'd see the positioning running through it. Um, so just like the DNA of our in our in our bodies makes us unique and and kind of shapes how we behave and uh, and how we develop, so the brand positioning in in a, in a brand is going to shape how it develops, um, how it communicates, and its job really is to steer the brand. Yeah. Um, so I talked about it being for you, being for the team, and it absolutely is for the team. It's in it's an internal tool. You're not going to see the brand positioning kind of writ large on a bill poster. Yeah, it's going to, it's for your team. Yeah. And um, so just like a rudder on a boat, you don't see the rudder on a boat. Yeah, you, you, but you see the direction it takes the boat. Well, this is the same principle with the brand positioning. It starts to steer the brand. Well, your brand positioning is a single word. That sounds frankly impossible. Uh, I'm usually told it is impossible, uh, but it isn't. It's entirely possible because I'm a great believer in uh, less is more. You know, I'm a great believer that the fewer the words, the more potent they, be they become. And and you know, I talked earlier on about the idea of um, a brand strategy being a, a framework to make good choices. You have got to make those choices as the brand owner. That's your responsibility. Yeah. It's not the responsibility of the graphic designer or the web agency or the ad agencies that's presented with a whole host of choices. Yeah, It's your job to make the choice about what your brand stands for. And so I think by kind of um, restricting the number of words to the bare minimum, you are giving very, very clear direction to your team internally, to your agencies, and of course, to your customer. Think of it like this. You know, if you are, um, um, you know, boiling a sauce, you know, you're reducing a sauce. The more you reduce that sauce, the more flavorful, more delicious it's going to become. And it's the same with uh, the brand positioning. The more we can distill down the essence of our brand to a single word, the more potent and the more powerful it will become. Brand positioning. And I've said that the brand positioning is for you. It's an internal tool, which it is. The brand proposition is how you express that positioning to your audiences, yeah? It's a few carefully chosen words that's gonna express the essence of your brand in a way that's clear, honest, and motivating. And is written for all of those who need to understand the brand. So, what the brand proposition isn't is war and peace. It's not a lengthy discourse. You could think of it, if it's helpful, as a slogan, although its job goes beyond purely the job of a slogan because it needs to engage your audience as well. Think of it as the start, the start of your story. Yeah, it's the introduction. It's the first few words um, of the story that you are going to tell about your brand. And these five or six words will appear um, pretty much everywhere your brand appears. So they may well appear on your business card. They'll maybe appear underneath your logo. They'll be on your website. And, and so the idea is that you are starting to tell the, the beginning of your story. Now, I like to think of your, your, your proposition kind of like as a, a, an open door into your brand. What you are doing with your proposition is you are helping your customers to seamlessly walk into your brand, to come into your store, yeah? And so you want the you want that proposition to be as as useful as possible for your team to start to have to talk about the narrative of your brand. Yeah, you want those doors to be doors to be as wide open as possible. You know, and if your brand proposition is wrong, you know, or if you've got something in your the way you describe your brand that you can't quite remember why you you say this, or it's a hangover from a different era, or whatever it may be then what you're in effect doing is you're placing a great big boulder in front of those open doors and you're having to kind of squeeze round the boulder <laughs> to get into your brand. You're, and you're having to 
can I help your customer? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I know that we talk about that, but actually we're all about this, yeah? And so a brand proposition kind of gets rid of that boulder and it helps you to be able to very easily uh, walk your customer into your brand. You know, if you've got a, a brand proposition that's wrong or misleading, yes, it may be a struggle to get your, your customers into your brand, but you know what could be worse? They don't even see your brand because your, uh, your introductory messaging isn't right. So they, this brand's not for me, I'll move on. So brand proposition, I thought I'd tell another story. And uh, being fair to uh, the, the, the tea drinkers of this world, uh, this is a story, we've had a story about coffee. So I'm now gonna tell you a story about tea. Um, and uh, this is a, a story um, about a brand of uh, tea called Hampstead Tea. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of super premium brand um, that is stocked in uh, very high-end stores around the world. You'll find it in Harrods, in Harvey Nicks. And the, 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 the reason for me telling this story is that they did have a point. Uh, and you know how obsessed I am with, with points. So they did have a point, but their point wasn't very sharp. Hampstead tea is a biodynamic tea. And you may well be asking yourselves, as I did, well, what, what, what's, what's, what's biodynamic? What's a biodynamic tea? So I asked this question, probably the first question I asked to the team um, at Hampstead Tea. And uh, let me read out three of their responses. Biodynamic tea is about harvesting and planting at the right time of year, as the moon rises, that type of thing. Biodynamic is an inspiration with an increasing arc of radiance, like the ripples of a pebble thrown into a pond. It's the weird and the wacky and very, very niche, but it brings nothing to the customer. So you can imagine how frankly useless uh, it was to have a, a point of a brand being biodynamic if nobody in the team had a clue what it stood for, or if everybody in the team had a different view. In fact, everybody in the team did have a different view about what biodynamic stood for. And so, um, for as this is um, an educational slot, let me tell you, I find this out, that um, it was founded by Rudolf Steiner back in the 1920s. It's kind of precursor to the organic movement. And what biodynamic farming or agricultural is all about is it views the farm as a single organism. So that everything in that farm, whether it's the, the crops, the soil, the insects, the animals, the people, they're all part of this same organism. And the job of an or a biodynamic agriculture is to make sure that all those different elements work in harmony with each other, that all are as healthy as possible. All good so far. You're thinking, well, this sounds fabulous. However, there are some aspects to biodynamic uh, agriculture that could be described as a little out there. For example, uh, they store chrysanthemum oil in tin chests in darkened basements and then bring them out when the full moon rises or various other astrological cycles and they spray their crops with them. Another example of what they do that might be seen as a little odd is that they bury uh, uh, manure in cow horns and, and skulls of small mammals. And then after six months, they bring them out and again use those for their crops. So the problem we had was that we had this uh, rather obscure um, definition um, of, of a variety of definitions of, of biodynamic. Um, and none of them seemed that appetizing, frankly. Um, and, um, and so we had a problem, but we managed to find a solution for that problem. And that was a conversation I had with Mr. Raja Banerjee, who was the owner of the Makapari tea estate, who, who grew the tea. And he said to me, you know, darling, it's all about the soil. Now, apparently he called everybody darling, um, I later found out, but he was absolutely right. And you know what? It's the only thing that um, the scientists can agree on, that actually biodynamic, biodynamic farms have more nutrients in their soil than uh, farms that are not biodynamic. More nutrients in the soil grow plants that are healthier. And from that, we got to the better the soil, the better the taste, and that, gave us a fantastic platform to start to help to get people into the brand. So it was understandable for the team, it was relevant to their customers, and it differentiated them from the competition. So that's just a, a proposition at work. But let's move on, I'm conscious of time. Values, this is not a particularly uh, difficult uh, concept to understand. 
it describes the character of, of your brand just as values describe our characters as people. And, you know, we want to be able to sum up the character of our brand. You know, I say that if you can't define your values, you can't use your values. And just as values shape a person, they also shape a brand. And I think they have two very, very important functions. I think the first is that they are incredibly influential internally. They play a vital role in keeping your team focused on what the brand stands for. I like to think of them as kind of like a benchmark for your team. You know, if we are going to create this new product, if we're going to do this new initiative, does it reflect our values? Is the, the presentation that we've just received from the design agency for a new brochure, does it reflect our values? Yeah. Um, and so they have a very, very important um, uh, role to play, both for the marketing team, but also for the HR team. Yeah, because your brand values uh, shouldn't be di different from the values of your company. They also play a very important role externally because they actually uh, um, kind of help your customers recognize you. Yeah, and this is so important yeah, that brands that are seen as a hallmark for your customers because your customers are going to be bombarded. You know, there's something like between four to 10,000 messages a day. And our brain does a very good job in screening out an awful lot of those messages. But what your values do is it helps your customers recognize you. Yeah, because you know, they recognize you by your values and they can also call you up when you don't meet your values. So they have a very, very important role to play in terms of providing a hallmark for your customers to recognize you by. So I've talked about um, the elements that go into our brand strategy. And I now want to talk about, OK, what can you do? With it? And frankly, you can do a great deal with with uh, with brand strategy. Um, and um, but I'm just going to focus on three, three things uh, uh, for brevity that, that you can do with the brand strategy. First is around your key messaging. I talked earlier on about this, this idea of, of choices. Yeah. And the, the, the role of a, of, a, of a brand strategy is to help you, the team, make good choices. And so so. Um, well, the, the first thing a brand strategy can help you um, is to ensure that um, you are relevant to your customers and different from your competition. So relevant and different. Now, that might seem like the bleeding obvious, but the point here is that um, you need to be both. So you need to be relevant. Yeah. You need to solve a problem for your client or your customer. But you can't just be relevant because if you're just relevant, you're the same as everybody else. So you need to be different from your competition. Yeah. But you can't just be different or you wouldn't have any customers. You need to be relevant and different. And I think this is this is um, a great way of then thinking, OK, well, how do we decide um, what is going to go first? I call it the tyranny of the first. There's always going to be a first thing, isn't there? There's always going to be a first thing on your website. You know, there's going to be a first headline on your website or the first chart in your deck. How do you know what is going to be the first thing? Now, if I if if I asked a client to give me the ten, five things about their business that, that they love, they'd have no problem at all. But if I asked them to tell me tell me one thing, they would have a problem. Yeah, because it's deciding what is the most important. So the other uh, point about um, messaging is you need to lead with the benefits not the features yeah why should i care about this brand what is in it for me and i think this is so important particularly for technology firms of which i work a lot with you know um, people are very comfortable talking about how we do things but that's not the first thing to talk about the first thing to talk about this will solve your problem yeah this will make you more efficient this will make you go faster this will this will reduce cost this will whatever it may be to start with your benefits, benefits and follow with features. The other great thing about developing a message, messaging hierarchy is it allows you to create an elevator pitch. Now, the story goes that the only way um, you'd be able to get hold of the boss would be to ride in the elevator down from the, the management suite on the top floor down to the ground floor and you had the time it took the elevator to go from the top floor to the bottom floor to pitch your idea to the boss and you know of course we're not allowed to spend any time in elevators at the moment uh, but there will come a day where we can um, but 
it's very, very useful to be able to define concisely your pitch, yeah? <laughs> it's very useful for things like social media, for example, or, you know, or the front page of, uh, the, of your, you know, the front page of your brochure or your, or your website, whatever. You know, it's going to, that brevity, that cutting to the, the chase is going to help you to cut through all the cacophony of noise that surrounds your, your customers. Because although bosses, customers, whatever, are now, you know, more accessible, there's more people talking to them. So uh, key messaging, a brand strategy that delivers key messaging will also deliver you your elevator pitch. Briefly, the curse of the brand name, you know, they're both very important and not important at all. They're important because they're everywhere. You know, um, there's a lovely story of a brand called Carl's Hill. I don't know if anybody's heard of Carl's Hill. It's a very famous brand. Um, it was founded by Jacob Jacobson. Um, he was a collector of art, a, a passionate believer in science, a very successful business person. And he decided to put all those skills together to create the perfect beer. He bought a brewery and uh, he built it on top of a hill and casting out for a name, he decided very nicely to call it after his son, Carl. So, uh, and as the brewery was on a hill, the brand was called Carl's Hill. Ah, I forgot to mention. The brand, of course, uh, uh, was in it was a Danish brand, and so the hill was a berg, and hence the name Carlsberg was born. Fast forward to this century, you know, and it's a testimony to the power of that name that when the brewer recently uh, changed every aspect of the brand from, from its formulation to its packaging, the name stayed. The brand is the most visible feature uh, of a brand. So think carefully before changing the name of your brand. And I think brands, very briefly, and there's more of this in my book, go into, fall into three categories. How do you know what sort of brand you've got left? Well, there are good, bad, and ugly names. A good name, of course, is going to help you with that, you know, keep those wide open doors to your business. It's going to help you seamlessly talk about the benefits of your brand. Um, a, uh, you know, an ugly uh, name um, is a name that's a bit clunky. It's not wrong, but perhaps it needs some help. It may need a word after it or may need a new identity or logo, or whatever, or a new colorway to help it sing. But a bad name is like having that boulder in front of your store. You need to change it. So good, bad and ugly names. Of course, we all know this, don't we, that a brand is not a logo. Um, um, a logo is an expression of your brand and um, they are very, very important and very uh, uh, being uh, graphically being able to communicate your brand and your brand strategy will really ensure that your logo you know, is working correctly. Um, and um, here's a quick pop quiz with two minutes left. Who can recognize the brand on the left? Of course, um, it's a bottle of Bass. You can see from the, the, the uh, red triangle there on the Bass beer bottle, that's one of the oldest logos in existence. We can see our two mini logos here, one from the 50s when it was owned by British Leyland and one uh, from um, when the brand was relaunched by, by BMW. And the reason for them staying together was they wanted to make sure that people understood that there was a relationship between the new mini and the old mini. So logos need to be distinctive, relevant and memorable. Roller color um, has an extremely important role to play um, um, in brands um, in supporting, uh, you know, where a brand is headed and where's a brand headed? Well, your brand strategy will tell you. Um, and so, so color plays a very important part in subliminally communicating things that customers are looking for. And if you want to be um, uh, kind of recognized as being part of a sector, then you choose the color that is most redolent in that set. I was talking to a colleague yesterday who's the head of brand at, um, at Diageo, and um, they're using a blue strip uh, to, uh, to represent their non-alcoholic uh, uh, products, because that's now the kind of de facto color. Blue happens to be a very calming color, yeah? It's very stable, it's very ordered, so a lot of banks and corporates use blue. A uh, red, very fiery, you know, most buy buttons on websites are red. You know, it has a it's, a, it's a real call to action. You know, each color has a different role to play. And I'm not saying that consumers say, ah, this brand is orange, therefore it must be creative, but they do have a very influential role to play, as does shapes. You know, most um, uh, rectangle squares are what we see most of in our daily lives. And so they are familiar. So brands that want to 
deliver familiarity will have will use shapes that are familiar so shapes and colors have a very important role to play i put all this into a book called what's your point i'm delighted to be able to say that it's on uh, on on offer at the cim bookshop and if you have questions for me that we don't get through tonight do please um uh, drop me an email i'd be I'd love to hear from you bruce at the and you can find all kinds of stuff on my website or my YouTube channel uh, that goes into brand strategy. Um, so it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm now going to um, hand back to Phil, who's going to manage our Q&A. Thank you. OK, many thanks, uh, Bruce. Uh, we'd now like to have a short Q&A session with you. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the question box in your control panel. Um, first question, Bruce, then, is what could be some examples of broad long vision versus narrow vision oh okay um well um, the broad long vision um I, I think two sentences is 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 plenty for a vision um you, if you make it too long then people get lost and they, they you, what bit should we focus on yeah so so i i think more than two cent i say 50 words when we do brand strategy development with clients kind of the discipline online is 50 words and the discipline when we're working together over a conference room table is you can only use a post-it note. So two sentences is an example of a of a the correct length for a brand vision. Okay. Okay. Are all elements of the brand strategy fixed for the duration? Are there any elements that are open to pivot? Really good question. Thank you. Um, the flaw in my business is that you don't tend to do brand strategies that often. So I would say I'm just doing a brand strategy for a client uh, where we la we lasted it seven years ago. They're really built for the medium term, yeah. Um, and and so and again, that's what differentiates, for example, a brand proposition from say a slogan. Slogan can change with the times, it can change with the products, but you want your proposition to have legs, yeah, because you know to 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 allow a brand strategy to take root in an organisation takes time yeah so but i think you can you can nuance you can change how your brand is presented um, as your market develops but it's a very very good question thank you okay thanks um some one or two questions around brand name so for example how do you choose a brand name what name makes a brand name memorable and the importance of the brand name could you please tell us some tips for creating a brand name well, yes, yes, uh, I, I do quite a lot of naming and um, I do naming based on brand strategy. So think of your brand strategy as the kind of um, a, a pool of knowledge that you can draw on to give you really good inspiration for things like how we're going to represent ourselves with our name. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of don't want your brand strategy to be typically over long. So, um, and I've said it, I'll say it again, it's around this idea of creating a framework to make good choices. So if, you, if you're creating a new company uh, or you want to sort of check the, the viability of your name, get your brand strategy and ask yourself what name would capture the values, for example, that we have defined. The way I do it is I take your six, our six values, our, my positioning, my proposition, and I usually end up with about eight or 10 words yeah, let's just say, for example, one of them is cohesion. As a, that's we're cohesive as an organization. Yeah, we deliver cohesion. Then I'll look to see, okay, what other ways can I describe cohesion? Yeah, and I'll come up with a list of five, six, seven. I use a thesaurus, and and by the time you've done that, you've got a great big A A A one piece of paper with your dozen or so keywords at the top, and underneath that, you've got a you know another twenty or thirty words that are correct. Yeah, they're right because they're from the brand strategy. And then it's the job of saying, which words do we think, you know, have the right mouthfeel, feel right for the sector, you know, um, feel have a modernity or reflect the tone of the, of the brand. And then it's a question of, well, looking to see what's available to buy as a, as a URL, et cetera, et cetera. Okie dokie. Um, what questions, tools do you think are useful to ask, use in order to dig deep into what brands, true values and mission are? So the, there is a process that I go through in the Brand Arrow uh, um, that, that helps clients and teams to be able to be in the right frame of mind to, uh, to answer those questions. Because the brand strategy, the, I have a, the, the Brand Arrow 
framework that I use is an actual arrow. Um, and the point of the arrow is, is the brand strategy itself, yeah? Um, but you leave that to the end. So I do four sessions. And, um, and what that allows you to do is to draw on your vision, your drivers, your key messaging, what makes you different, yeah? How, uh, your audience, we haven't talked about audience, we haven't had time today, but I always say, well, let's look at our audiences and then let's look at what characteristics they all share. So that, ta that kind of um, platform allows you to then uh, go into the key question for me, which is, what is it that runs through everything? What's the thread? Yeah. What's our DNA? If we cut this open, what are we going to see? Yeah. I find that the hardest. And when I get to the positioning, sorry, I should have said positioning. When I get to the positioning, I do a little jig normally because for me, it's the key that unlocks the brand. So that's what you need to go for. That's the most potent and persuasive element of your brand strategy. Um, and of course, it's for you, it's for your team. Hope that helps. Um, Bruce, you've talked a lot about uh, consumer brands and um, this question here, which really relates to B2B. So is sure. it difficult to develop a brand identity for a contractor in a construction no. industry that provides no, multiple no. services across different service categories? And if not, yeah. what are the key points to consider? Thank you so much um, for that question. And yeah, I'm, I recognize both my examples, uh, for all three of my examples are consumer facing brands. So I think I, I may well have used them because they're a bit, they're a bit of fun, but I would say probably 90% of my clients are B2B clients. And it's much more important, I think, for a B2B brand to have a really, really good, clear idea about its brand because it doesn't have the kind of resources that a lot of B2C brands have for marketing. Yeah. So whatever it does, it has to be sure that it's right. Um, so when I get told, listen, we've got um, 20 different products, you know, or 20 different markets. How can we have some, you know, we need something that's going to be representative, you know, for each of those different ones. So I say, well, you've got one brand. Yeah. You don't have a separate brand for all those different. You've got one brand. So we need to make sure that when we develop our brand strategy, that it is inclusive, that it is relevant to every part of your business. And that means elevating. You know, if we find we're getting stuck in the detail, you know, then we move it up a level, yeah, so we can get a, a more holistic view. Um, I, I happen to be working with um, um, an architectural firm and a, uh, a, a firm in the construction sector. I don't have, any, I don't work on any with any particular sector. You know, brand strategy crosses sectors because the truths of a brand are the same, whatever your brand is. But thank you very much for pointing that out, and I hope that's cleared it up. That all all the things I've been talking about throughout this session are as appropriate to B2B as they are to B2C. Okay, when a brand is supposedly stuck with a negative stereotype, i.e. gap, being old fashioned 90s fashion, how can they effectively adapt to reshape themselves or can its stereotypes be marketed positively, effectively to act as a strength? It's a very good question. The, you know, what, what brand strategy isn't is marketing strategy. And what the brand strategy is doing is is getting to the truth of a brand. You know, why was Gap successful? And uh, it, the, some of that success will have will be down to catching the zeitgeist, but there will be principles in that within that organisation that may well have been lost or forgotten about, or that are adhered to but they're not executed well that will uh, allow that and if you call those out if you recognize those and uh, express those in a way that's understandable then you can shape how you can shape how those are expressed to meet your different audiences your different um, trends in the market your different demands but brand strategy is about defining and refining the truths of an organization and those truths will be long term um you may already have asked, answered this question to some extent, Bruce, but um, we were talking earlier about B2B. Does branding differ for charities? No, not at all. Um, it doesn't differ. I mean, the messaging that you use from your brand strategy will obviously be reflective of their audience. Um, but, you know, if charities, um, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, uh, you know, to characterize charities as being resource strapped, but many are. And so, again, it's much more important 
that it was well, sorry it's not much more important it's very very important that whatever resource they do use in marketing or product development they can be absolutely sure that that it's strategically sound so i think the the, the relationship between between brand and marketing is a very close relationship uh, and and i always characterize marketing as how you shape the brand how you present the brand to engage with your customers um, and so i think for charities a brand strategy is very very important uh, particularly if you're going to also engage with for example very maybe a large volunteer uh, network you really need to understand what the brand stands for okay great Please, can you explain again the difference between brand positioning and brand proposition? Sure. Positioning is an internal tool and your proposition is used externally, one way of thinking about it. Your positioning is one word, and your proposition is a sentence, maybe like six or seven words. Think of your proposition as a slogan. Yeah, your position sums up the DNA. It's like kind of like what runs through everything that you do. Your proposition is how you express that to your audiences. Uh, it's a, it's, I appreciate that, that this is terminology and, a, and a, an approach that isn't necessarily that well known. Um, and that's again, one of the reasons um, I wrote the book because I just think that, that, that each has a role and that each, over, each, each role is very important for the success of a business. Because I do believe that a brand strategy can help grow a business. Um, and so, so that's the difference. Positioning is is the kind of DNA, and your proposition is an expression of that DNA. Okay. Um, Bruce, you worked on lots of brands, so can you give us an example of a brand? You know, give it, let us know what their uh, positioning and proposition actually is. Well, I could talk about Orange. I was head of brand at Orange, but um, as they as they don't belong anymore to the UK, um, I don't feel like. <laughs> but. Oh, okay. um, I can uh, let me talk about. Um, well, I think I think we talked about. So I'm just thinking about B two B. Yeah, I work for a brand called Blue Yonder, um, and um, they're a German. Well, well, they're a German-based um, AI brand. They are they provide predictive analytics for the retail trade, um, and they were recently purchased by JDA Software which is a very well, multi-billion dollar software business, supply chain business in the US. And um, I work with them um, to refocus their brand on the retail sector. Up to that point, they worked across sectors um, and they wanted to focus on retail because retail they thought was the biggest market for them. And so uh, what we had to do was to re refocus the brand to give it a retail, um, a retail shape, you know, uh, to make it feel like it was part of the fabric of retail because the retail market is very insular. P retailers only really like to kind of deal with other retailers. Um, and so the positioning that we developed for Blue Yonder was leading decisions. Now, um, you're immediately going to say to me, hang on a minute, Bruce, you said there's only one word, and now you're, 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 you're giving us a positioning <laughs> with two words. Sometimes, I think I must have been feeling generous that day, but no, joking apart, sometimes if you need a slight, slightly more um, richness, you can uh, add, you know, add a word. And leading decisions did two things. Firstly, it recognized that they wanted to be a leader in their sector. And the, the hallmark of a leader is that you need to be able to be followed. Yeah, You can't be a leader if you don't have followers. Um, and so um, th they needed to recognize that they needed to, 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 stand, to stand up and be more of a leader. But the decisions piece was the key because unlike pretty much every single one of their competitors, what they didn't provide was a dashboard that clients could use to sort of improve things. They simply told them the answer. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, Morrison's is their, one of their customers. And Morrison's get every, every day, they get a list of things to buy from Blue Yonder. They don't get choices. They get told what the decision is. And this was, was, was what made them distinct. And that ran through everything they did. So their positioning was leading decisions. Um, and their proposition was best decisions delivered daily. This idea of um, had a kind of retail feel to it, best decisions delivered daily. And the idea there was we're saying we are delivering you decisions. We're not delivering you um, the means to make decisions. We are delivering those decisions on a daily basis. And um, the brand was very successful. 
was bought by JDA and JDA liked the brand so much they renamed themselves Blue Yonder. So so there we are. Right. The example. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Um Bruce, we've run out of time for the questions now. So um thank you very much for that. There's some there's some really fascinating questions and some great answers. So I'd just like to say thank you to Bruce for today's presentation and a thank you to all of you for attending. Um I hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Um, our next online marketing club event takes place at 6.30 on Thursday, the 18th of March, when CIM course director Abigail Dixon will talk about developing customer insight to drive marketing strategy. You'll find further details listed on the CIM website events page, where you can also book for the event. So it just leaves me to say on behalf of CIM, thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>